Welcome, my name is James Bushell. I'm a senior platform engineer at LogicWorks. Today we'll be designing a three-tier web application on Azure. So the first step is to establish our networking topology. Now, rather than deploying our all of our Azure resources within one virtual network, we are going to separate, we are going to create several virtual networks by and separate them by SDLC tier. So in this example, we have two SDLC tiers. We have dev and prod. Now, before we continue, we need to establish a third vir uh, virtual network and environment called hub or shared services. Now, the purpose of this virtual network and environment is to deploy all of our shared or dependent services within the hub virtual network. Now, in order to allow connectivity between dev and prod, we need to establish VNet peering from the dev and prod virtual networks to the hub virtual network. The main, one of the main benefits to the hub and spoke model is network isolation. Network isolation allows us to establish isolation between SDLC tiers. In this scenario, the resources that would live in the development environment cannot communicate to the production environment. This prevents unattended changes and issues. Another benefit of the hub and spoke model is the separation of concerns. This allows us to make changes in the lower level environment first in order to ensure um, we are not impacting the users that are accessing our production environment. Once changes are validated in the development environment, we can make them in the production environment and have a, great, have a good idea uh, of what that impact is going to be. The third benefit to the hub and spoke model is compliance. In general, network isolation and separation of concerns are best practices. However, they're required by various compliances such as PCI, HIPAA, and high trust. For all these reasons, the hub and spoke model is used as a staple in 90% of our Azure architectures. Okay, now that we have established our network topology and went over the benefits of the hub and spoke model, let's expand on this further. First, we need to establish the subnets within our virtual networks. Here, you can see the pink boxes here are our public subnets. The green boxes here are our private subnets. In order to gate access, we are going to create network security groups and assign them to each of the subnets. This allows us to only allow common ports and protocols required by our application into the subnet. So next, we need to establish connectivity from our on-prem data center. Now, in order to do that, we're going to deploy a VPN gateway. This will allow us to establish a site-to-site -site or IPsec tunnel. And because we have peers established, connectivity from the on-prem network can flow to the various environments such as dev and prod. So now that we have connectivity established from our on-prem data center into our Azure virtual network, we need to deploy uh, a main point of ingress for the operating system layer. We are going to do that by deploying a Linux bastion. We can also extend connectivity for roaming users by allowing a public IP and establishing a, a, another network security group and the virtual inter interface of the bastion. From here, we can allow we can allow our common port, such as 22 at the subnet le level. Then we can allow our common sources, such as the subnets from our on-prem data center and um, other source IPs from our engineers and administrators. So this establishes two main points of ingress into our Azure environment. We can, we can access it via the allowed subnets from our on-prem data center and from the allowed source IPs um, that could be your engineers, administrators, home offices, other satellite offices, 
this gives a nice flexibility of connectivity into the Azure environment, but also maintains uh, general security practices and uh, prevents unauthorized access into the Azure network. So now that we're starting to deploy our virtual machines, let's first talk about our storage accounts. So one of the main things we need to do here is deploy a storage account, which allows us to configure our boot diagnostics from our virtual machines to our storage accounts. If we run into issues with virtual machines inability to boot completely, we can look at the various logs that are sent to the storage account. Now that we have established our main two points of connectivity and have gone over the boot diagnostic logging for storage accounts, we can move on to deploying our second set of virtual machines in our hub environment. Here, we want to deploy a set of Active Directory domain controllers to be used as our identity source. This allows us to create user accounts uh, for our various administrators and engineers and restrict access as necessary to our various operating systems. First, we're going to create an availability set. When running Active Directory domain controllers, we want to ensure that this is highly available. In order to do so, we're going to deploy two domain controllers. These are going to live inside the, the availability set. The availability set allow, ensures our virtual machines are running on separate hypervisors, racks, and have their own power sources. So here, as we discussed, we're going to configure our boot diagnostics for our domain controllers as well to talk to the hub storage account. Again, this ensures that if we have any trouble booting our virtual machines, we can get the necessary information to troubleshoot that. Okay, so now that we've established our connectivity into our Azure environments, we've established our hub uh, virtual network and the resources that live within them, we're going to move on to the production environment. The production environment is where our user-facing application is going to live. In order to ensure a three-tier web application remains highly available, we are going to deploy two virtual machines for the web and application tiers. Now, in order to ensure connectivity can flow to both copies of, of each tier, we're going to be using load balancers. Now, the front end tier of this web application is going to be responding to HTTP and HTTPS requests. In order to facilitate that, we are going to deploy an application gateway. This is a layer seven load balancer, which allows us to forward HTTP and HTTPS requests over to our front end tier. So here, we're going to deploy or create another availability set. Then we're going to place our web virtual machines here. Next, we need to establish our web tier as backend nodes of our application gateway. This is how traffic will flow from the application gateway to the front end. Now we're going to create another availability set. Then we will place our application virtual machines inside them. Now, in order to ensure connectivity from the web instances can flow properly to the application tier, we're going to establish another load balancer. Depending on your application requirements, this can be either be another layer seven load balancer such as the application gateway or a layer four load balancer such as the Azure load balancer. Now that we've established the two main tiers of our application, we are going to work on the final tier, which is our Azure SQL database. Azure SQL is a managed database service provided by Azure. Here, we, can, we will establish connectivity from our application tier directly to our Azure SQL database. Now, in order to ensure connectivity is there, we need to allow the source, the subnet or source IPs of our application instances on the firewall associated with our Azure SQL. From there, we will have connectivity from our application tier directly to the Azure SQL database. Because we are using the standard Azure SQL database, 
This does not actually live inside of our virtual network. Now that we have designed our highly available web application in our production environment, we're going to move over to the development environment. This is going to be a smaller pared down version. So first, we're going to establish our application gateway. Now, this isn't always needed. However, it is, in general, it is a good idea to try to make your lower level environment as close as possible to your production environment to better test your changes. So next, we're going to establish our one web virtual machine. Then we're going to establish that as a backend node. Now, the benefit to putting the application gateway in front of it as well is that if we ever need to rebuild or redeploy this web instance, we can redeploy it and associate it with the backend pool very easily. We do not need to change DNS or any of the public facing aspects of this. So now that we've established our front end, which is the application gateway and web virtual machine, we're going to establish our second tier, the application tier. So here we're going to deploy one application virtual machine. Now we have two options. Either we can configure connectivity directly from the web virtual machine to, app, to the app application tier, which would save us some cost. However, it is not directly similar to our production environment. So what is a preferred option or scenario is to deploy another load balancer just like production and establish the application virtual machine as the backend node of this middle tier load balancer. So now that we have the two main tiers, we are then going to create our Azure SQL database and ensure that connectivity by whitelisting the source IP or subnet of the application tier. So now that we've, uh, we've created our overall architectural diagram, there are a couple other services that we wanna make use of and put in place in order to better help us secure, manage, and support the environment moving forward. The first one we're gonna deploy is a key vault. This allows us to store our secrets, certificates in a secure manner and prevents us from storing any application secrets in our source code. These can be dynamically looked up at any point using the Azure API. Next, we need to monitor our infrastructure. So Azure has a number of services such as Azure Monitor that allows us to use pre-baked metrics or send our own application logs to Azure Monitor. There are two main components to Azure Monitor. The one that we're going to be talking about today is Log Analytics. This is a workspace that is deployed and we then establish our diagnostic settings for each of our Azure resources. So this means essentially any Azure resource, application gateway, our virtual machines. We will configure diagnostic settings for each of our Azure resources to flow to the log analytics workspace. We can then further, if necessary, write, log, write application logs directly to log analytics. From here, we can create metric alerts, log alerts that will notify us when an issue with our application comes up. Um, so now that we've established the general monitoring practice, we need to, we need to ensure that we can patch our virtual machines. So Azure has a nice solution which comes with your automation account. We now tie our automation account to the log analytics workspace and use the update management feature to automatically onboard all of our virtual machines for automated patching. Once the virtual machines have been onboarded for patching, we can create schedules and ensure our virtual machines are updated in an automated fashion. Now we've established monitoring for our Azure resources, automated patching for our virtual machines. The next we need to do is to ensure our virtual machines are being backed up in case we need to revert if there is an issue. In order to do so, we're going to deploy the recovery vault 
service. This allows us to onboard our virtual machines for backups to the recovery vault. During that onboarding process, we establish a policy which tells Azure when you want to back up and how often. So that's our three-tier application architecture on Azure. If you're interested, LogicWorks is an expert MSP and can help you design a custom Azure architecture. To learn more, visit www.logicworks.com.